Beth Lawson here for the two of our ten series uh, today and tomorrow. Um, we feel like we've known them forever. <laughs> <laughs> we were born together. We were born, we were born together. together. <laughs> um, so Jack is now a distinguished professor at Penn State in Information Sciences and Technology. Um, he is in the Chi Academy. He's an ACM fellow. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award very early in the Chi history. He's a true pioneer in HCI. Uh, it's back when there wasn't a field like this. He was, he was still doing it at IBM Research. Uh, if you know anything about scenario-based design, design rationale, scaffolding, training wheels, that's all Jeff. Uh, and some of it Mary Beth as well. Uh, he was very early in getting uh, communities to be online. That was the Blacksburg Village Project. Uh, and I think he's going to talk some more today about uh, that kind of community infrastructure. Please, let's welcome uh, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, so uh, I have too many slides, as you can see from the count there. <laughs> so, uh, my one way of dealing with this is to tell you what the whole talk is about case it doesn't get finished. <laughs> what you meant it to be about. <laughs> yeah. And basically, I'm talking about, I want to uh, ponder two views of community. One is kind of uh, almost a meme, really, which is that uh, community informatics, and community for that matter, is about last-ditch social remediation. Community's in trouble. It's going away. And... Um, you know, community informatics could be a set of strategies to use technology to slow that or reverse it. Um, but another uh, way of looking at community, and one I want to push in this uh, context, is the idea that community is a place for routine socio-technical innovation. And, um, and the idea there is that it's a it's a, it's a comfortable place, it's where you live, it's right outside your door, um, and that maybe you can work with your neighbors on something besides stasis, which is you know, the sort of uh, conventional view of community. So I'm sort of urging, pushing community. You know, if you love something, set it free. All right, so uh, what is community? Well, it's a foundation uh, for uh, society, for human society, for citizenship, and um, community structures, trace them back to Paleolithic hunting bands and uh, Neolithic villages, although the connection of what we know as community to these early structures is rather metaphorical since uh, hunting bands are 50 people and early villages were 150, and our communities, when they're small and intimate, there are several tens of thousands of people, and that's a small town. Um, but it's very important, uh, or has been alleged to be very important for the development of identity, for uh, our emergence as uh, humans, as uh, adults, learning to work together, uh, learning the skills that will enable us to work together <coughs> in life. And it's also an interesting kind of uh, social support structure, people usually play more than one role, which is called multiplexed, and um, they're also highly brokered um, organizations in the sense uh, Ronald Byrd has uh, coined that term. So generally, people are very uh, connected, more than averagely connected, certainly more than the kinds of brokering uh, Byrd describes. So to return to this crisis and loss uh, meme, it goes back to Turnies, who's the, the uh, <coughs> German sociologist who uh, first distinguished uh, community and society, or uh, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, excuse me, Alfred. I'll just charge right in and say a foreign word I can't pronounce. Um, but, but there are echoes of this all through the sociology of community, which was the main business of American sociology for the first uh, 80 years or so. Um, Warren talks about the great change that occurred in the uh, 1900s of integrating all of our uh, social institutions vertically instead of horizontally, meaning that, for example, 
school is no longer the business of a local community, it's integrated vertically through the, through the whole society and everybody gets a, an instance of a national school. That, of course, is not so true in the United States, but in lots of other places, most other places. Um, and then all the way to Putnam, who famously realized everybody's bowling alone and watching television and community has kind of gone away. What's, what's most salient about this is there really isn't any program for fixing any of this. In fact, far from the program for fixing it, um, it's, it's really argued that there are no remedies and that basically community will continue to be lost, although if you have a mathematical bent to your mind, that can't be true. Things can't keep debiting and not reach zero. But anyway, uh, setting that aside, uh, one of the great uh, articulations of this is James Coleman, who we all know for the social capital construct. But in his book, Community Conflict, in 1957, he talked about patterns of community conflict and trajectories for conflict. And they actually all end up with the community dissembling. So uh, there are no remedies for this. So this isn't a, a very comfortable view to hold, and it's hard to see where to go with it. So I'm, I know I'm making a slightly exaggerated um, distinction, but another way of looking at community is more of a collection of practices and, and skills. And one place you can look at a start for that is Alexis de Tocqueville, who uh, visited the United States in the early 1830s, wrote a book uh, called Democracy in America, which was... Um, <coughs> It's constructed in various ways when you look at references to it, but it's actually, like this talk in fact, <laughs> it's a kind of an exploration of looking for ideas. So he's not, I don't think he's really arguing for a point of view so much as asking after the democratic uh, uh, blizzard works its way through the earth, you know, what are we going to do? because there is a certain stability in feudalism as it was implemented in Europe and everywhere else. Um, and he realized that was not going to last, um, and he's asking what's going what's to happen in the future. And one thing he noticed in American society that excited him was the uh, voluntary local association. It's the way Americans got a lot of business done by working together at a local level, which was not true in Europe. Of course, just to put things in context, a Frenchman in 1835, who's in middle age, if you think about it, is lived through the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era, so he's a pretty traumatized person. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so you could look more at these skills, like the, uh, he called them habits of the heart, that's his, uh, it's Tocqueville's phrase. Um, look at these voluntary associations, how they work, uh, what kind of skills they consist of, uh, what kind of things they do. Or, in the uh, psychology of community, which uh, emerged uh, later than the sociology of community, where uh, people like Saracen and his uh, students and their students were working on the experience of community, uh, the consequences of belonging and investment, I think one problem I have with this work is it was over-influenced by um, cognitive dissonance, which is another one of these traumatic ideas that swept through psychology, and it's very dismal in a lot of ways. It's also right, you know, to a considerable extent. But anyway, I want to uh, circle back to Tocqueville and think more about these uh, possibilities for doing community and uh, implications of that. So my plan is to take another look at community networks, which is the original movement of community informatics, which took place between, roughly between 1973 and 1998, and uh, reconstruct that as an innovation movement, which is not the way it's always looked at. And then I want to push community with technology with these uh, six themes, and I'll tell you in advance, this is a working agenda. These aren't really independent or optimally factored. They're six things I thought of. Um, because as I said, like Tocqueville, I'm, I'm, uh, 
I, I see this as something we inevitably have to come to terms with, but I don't know how to do that. So I'm looking for lenses to uh, do it better. And then, of course, wrap up the talk if I get that far. So community networks. Um, this is a really odd idea that uh, somebody had in 1973, which was to connect the community to itself with networking. It's an odd idea for several reasons. Again, putting on a historical context to this, the Internet did not exist in 1973. In fact, almost no one was aware that networking was a possibility for using computers. Uh, and networking itself really meant a, a coaxial cable. So that's how you ne would network things, uh, and that was the only way. Um, anyway, uh, and there were mixed motives for this, and part of them are uh, communitarian in the, uh, the uh, usual sense, uh, which I've mentioned leads to this meme of community loss, and that is reminding us of our values and bringing us closer, giving us ways of relating to one another. But they also had a very strong activist agenda, things they wanted to do to change society. Um, and that's what I, I want to emphasize. So here are a few that I picked. Um, in this period, there were about 1,000 community networks in uh, North America. There are related projects in other continents, but I'm not going to talk about them today. And they really weren't like this at all. Um, the, um, Berkeley Community Memory is the first uh, community network, and this is the one that's mainframe based. Um, you could start a community forum for a quarter. Uh, it, they, they had very famous uh, projects as we look back, like online uh, remembrances of um, people who died in the Vietnam War, which was one of the traumas of uh, that society. and. Uh, and also uh, an agenda of how to democratize society further through information. And that's the kind of uh, activist agenda that I wanted to uh, call attention to. I'll also talk briefly about the Cleveland Freenet, uh, Big Sky Telegraph, uh, Santa Monica <coughs> Public Electronic Network, which is very close to you guys, uh, Santa Monica being a beach town west of LA. And, uh, they had a, um, uh, a community network, which was a closed networking system. Very interesting idea. Of course, again, predating the internet, who would have thought you wanted to connect to the whole world? But so it wouldn't have had, they wouldn't have had access to uh, our extensive experience with doing that. But this is, this is a, a, a case where there were direct uh, dialogues between homeless people and the mayor of Santa Monica. It's really unprecedented kind of thing that couldn't even happen today, but it happened then. And it, it was also productive since it led to better facilities for homeless in that town at that time. And Judy mentioned the Black, Blacksburg Electronic Village, which I was part of and is mainly famous because it was the first community network to be implemented in the uh, web infrastructure. So just a quick look back at some of these projects. <coughs> This is the Berkeley Community Memory. Um, only a few of you will recognize this kind of computing equipment as possibly have, having ever existed, but it did exist. And in fact, uh, our term, which has been adapted in several ways, the electronic bulletin board, comes from the terminal, which looked like this, it's not this one, but it was, uh, it was in Leopold's record store in Berkeley, uh, right underneath the bulletin board. Bulletin board being cork board with pins and so forth. So the electronic bulletin board was right under it. Um, the Cleveland Freenet, a few years later, is quite an interesting and active uh, innovation project in several ways. First of all, their idea was that public health information should be accessible to everybody through uh, network computing. Quite a radical idea for 1985. And uh, also, interestingly, they abstracted the, um, the software framework that this was built in and provided it to people who wanted to start community networks in any other community. So it's really uh, end user programming also. Uh, way ahead of its time. 
And then the Blacksburg Electronic Village, again, innovative for its time, although uh, uh, many of you, even the younger people here, might have had experiences with this Web 1, which was kind of clunky. It's essentially a, a, a way of uh, making information hierarchies not as awful to interact with. But it enabled activism, too. Uh, for one thing, the ease of uh, incorporating images into uh, this kind of a community networking infrastructure had a big impact. In, in this case, um, this very scary picture of what could happen in South Central Virginia was enough to make uh, Interstate 73 not happen. <laughs> Interstate 73 to this day is in North Carolina, but it's not violated Virginia. I don't know that this was the reason, but, but it, it, uh, it couldn't possibly have hurt. <clears throat> so um, my point is to observe that however these uh, infrastructures may have drawn people in the communities together, made them more interdependent, value one another more, developed social um, ties and so forth, they were also innovative. They were new ways to do new sorts of things. And um, they were operating in a community context. And uh, as we look back, they were, they, were, uh, they were creating new vitality and new sources of power in a community, whatever else they were doing. So I want to push community with technology in this spirit. And so inspired by this earlier work, I want to suggest ways we could move uh, community informatics to be more uh, innovative and to be more about innovation. So what I've done here is I've listed six um, distinctive themes or commitments of uh, community informatics, um, sort of, uh, let's say, the established view of it on the on the. Well, let's see, it's my left. I guess it's your left, too. And, um, and on the right, uh, ones I suggest we could try to move toward or, or push. Um, and they include uh, learning and trying new things together, uh, recruiting people who will change things, critically in integrating information sources, instead of just being aware, some, some more uh, active um, kind of awareness um, to make conflict in, uh, more visible instead of less visible. As if you've read uh, James Coleman's book, you want to make it less visible because you know it will cause your community to die. But um, that may not be right. It may be a matter of whether you want to be driven by descriptive studies of conflicts that occurred, or whether you want to be innovative and take a chance on a new way of doing things. Um, and uh, identifying and uh, better leveraging uh, resources, and finally, co-production, which I want to distinguish from just being supportive or even being altruistic. OK, so learning and trying new things together, um, this is a an old project from that uh, Blacksburg Electronic Village uh, infrastructure. So this would be a 1995 uh, effort. And um, I was very inspired by a statement by Andrew Cohill, who I otherwise thought was not a very nice person. But <laughs> he was the director of this BEV project. And he once very offhandedly said to me that the real meaning of this is is it's a very large-scale learning project. And, uh, it, well, I still remember it now. Um, and I think that's really true. So here's an example where, uh, when I met the, the Blacksburg Seniors Group, they were sharing emails about uh, what we might call oral history or personal history. So these people are all over 60 years old, and when they think about what the town was like when they were young, that's history. Um, it's also really inaccessible to a lot of younger people. So we thought you know, this would be a good thing to share. They wanted to share it. And it was actually 
fairly easy to share through the web and had a much bigger impact on the whole community uh, through doing that, creating a dialogue. So this is just a, a, a simple forum system where you can tell a story and then people can post comments. And what we found is a lot of these stories did evoke comments. People were amazed at things that had happened in places that they were familiar with um, all the years before. This also had some indirect effects. It made the seniors much more visible. They had the fairly outlandish ambition to be technology leaders in the town, <laughs> although they weren't always able to articulate what that might mean, but this actually caused it to happen. So people looked at them as a source of innovative ideas about what to do with the BEV besides, as I showed you that earlier, a um, couple of slides, ideas of what to do with it. Um, it also had uh, interesting, we had the opportunity to discover interesting and I think innovative things that weren't possible before. So this phenomenon of lost Hokies, you probably know people from Virginia Tech call themselves Hokies. Um, the lost Hokies were people who no longer lived in Virginia Tech, but with this web-based infrastructure, they could look at these pages as easily as anybody else could. And so they could continue to participate in the community, at least to this extent, um, despite being uh, far away. Um, okay. And more recently, this is 2014, we're still uh, still looking at innovative ways to do similar things. Uh, one reason for this is that is part of this old view of communities. Um, uh, communities are about making places, making community places and imbuing them with meaning. And uh, our Lost State College app is, uh, of course, able to do things that we couldn't do with just that uh, simple web site. So if you walk to a place like this is the Hotel State College in a photograph from the 1930s, it's still there. It doesn't look that different, actually. And, um, uh, but when you walk there, you can access this information, and you can also participate in the usual so so social media interactions like commenting and liking. And uh, people were uh, interested in this. They uh, could use it uh, anytime, anywhere. Uh, we did a, a study sort of walking people around uh, for the first 14 sites we documented and found that, you know, of course, people who lived there longer related to it differently than people who lived there less. But people were very interested in a sort of unique, quirky history of things they'd seen possibly every day for years and had no idea what it was, for example. There's a, one collection of small statues there. It's a family of pigs. <laughs> and I have saw it many times. It's, it's a landmark in the town, of course. Uh, I've not, why, were, why a family of pigs? And it turns out it has something to do with when um, animals were allowed to run free in the town and, and when that policy was changed. So, um, yeah, similarly, there's a sinkhole which became a football field, but it had earlier been the town dump. Because <laughs> the, the Pennsylvania geology is one of uh, these uh, sinkholes that open up in the earth. You've probably read about them. They're horrifying to people who live anywhere else. Uh, but I don't know, they open up, they can be very deep and very inviting to throw your trash in there, I guess. And so that's what they did. So another. So I should say that more or less all the other examples that I'm going to talk about are also examples of learning and trying new things together. So that's an example of how these are not, um, you know, independent uh, themes. But the second theme, the second non-independent theme, is um, recruiting people who will change things. And this is an interesting perspective on community if you think about innovation. For example, Big Sky Telegraph uh, was one of the first uh, implementations of online courses, but it had, Big Sky Telegraph was in Montana, the United States, but it had a kind of a, of a downside effect. Kids took the courses and began to, began to think about going to MIT, and then they did. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they don't come back to Montana. So, you know, 
I, I don't know if that's not all good, but it's not all bad either. Um, but it does make the challenge of recruiting people who will change things uh, more complex. And these stressors are, are very apparent uh, nowadays. You can see them as a sign of, um, you, know, um, you know, may you live in interesting times, uh, or worse than that. But there's a lot of economic turbulence. Everybody knows in the world population shifts that are going on. It's run the news every day now because they've gotten so horrible. And of course, uh, weather and climate changes, such as, I don't know, is your, is your lack of rain an example of that, or was that yeah. always true? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's examples of it everywhere. Um, well, what this requires is a different kind of thinking. So uh, resilient strategies convert stressors into social resources. Um, um, for example, just being aware of problems could be a source of strength, could be a resource, you know, but you don't always problematize it that way. Um, because you need to be aware and confront problems as opposed to those you, prevention and mitigation are not going to be sufficient strategies for, uh, for those. Um, an example in small towns like the one I live in is that we used to talk about town gown tensions. But really, the new town down crisis is, is, is called graduation because we lose, just like Montana, we lose all of our innovative young people every year. They finish up, and because they have never become engaged in the local community, it's not even a possibility that they're going to stay in our area. They just leave. Now, in a previous day, people wouldn't have even thought that was a problem. They would just think, well, isn't that what happens? Now they think it's a problem. And there are strategies in my town to recruit and retain graduates, which I think is really interesting. But it shows how um, some of these uh, stressors are forcing innovation, uh, forcing us to think differently about, in our case, the undergraduate population passing through. Um, Here's an, uh, another earlier project. This is from a later period in that Blacksburg Electronic Village project. Um, and the idea here was to make the town seem more innovative to people, or that's one of the ideas anyway. Um, the project we called Mooseburg was a web-based uh, moo that um, uh, visualized the town, could be navigated like a virtual uh, reality space and we were directly enabling certain things we wanted people to do, like build your own neighborhood in, into this uh, infrastructure. Or we worked directly with some groups like Save Our Streams so they could use this map widget uh, to uh, annotate water quality readings. Blacksburg is one of these towns that uh, buried a stream that used to run through it, Struble's Creek, which is a terrible idea. <laughs> And now they can't go back from that idea, but they, so they have to live with a, a stressed and deteriorating stream. So uh, water quality is a big uh, interest there. Um, but they indirectly enable other things. For example, this is the uh, Virginia uh, Museum of Natural History uh, that exists in Blacksburg. And some students created uh, a tool that allowed you to disperse artifacts from the museum throughout the, the town, actually throughout the town's virtual doppelganger. And uh, actually, one of those students was James Fogarty, who is now a professor. <laughs> at, isn't he coming here? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So you can ask him about that. Yeah, he was an undergraduate when he did this. And uh, also, uh, an, uh, an apartment company uh, an apartment complex in Blacksburg made virtual walkthroughs. This is a fairly common thing to do now. If you are going on sabbatical, you rent apartments this way, but uh, wasn't that common in 1999. Um, so uh, this this uh, theme of recruiting people uh, who will change things is um, one of the concepts that other people have have come up with is the idea of community animation. Community animation is enabling and facilitating community level innovation. Uh, so it's, so you learned a new term if nothing else. <laughs> but uh, 
this is this has had an interesting effect and again I'm drawing on my own town a lot of my research is is really uh, placed in in the town I live in um, uh, this new leaf initiative was started by uh, a couple of uh, Penn State alumni who didn't leave but who stayed and they are community animators I mean they don't really do anything but they facilitate everything and uh, it may sound um, I don't know, it's, it can sound uh, um, puzzling or, uh, you know, like how, how could that be? But they've been so effective, they actually were given a big studio in, in town hall so they could do it more. Um, but it, it has been effective and it led to a, another thing called the co-space, which is a residential arrangement where 12, I'm tempted to say young people, I'm sure they're younger than me, but uh, they may not be really young, but there are 12 people who want to live and breathe innovation, live together in this co-space uh, for periods of time working on innovations. And then other people move in to take their places. So these kinds of institutions weren't standard equipment in communities uh, even, uh, even 20 years ago. And finally, uh, uh, the town itself, um, and th this wasn't... I mean, I'm aware of this because I work with the town, but I also just read this in the newspaper. Um, they, want, they have the, the perennial problem that municipal government has of how to prioritize uh, what's going to be done. You know, in fact, bickering over this is pretty much what municipal government is about. But um, their, their approach, which I thought was extremely innovative, it hasn't been implemented yet, but was to use uh, a kind of crowdfunding uh, or uh, you know, a mechanism where if you want to do something, you put it out there as a proposal and see how many people are actually willing to pony up money or sweat equity or something to do it, as opposed to just trying to influence the town council. Uh, to do it from the top down. But I think that's a highly innovative uh, um, way to do this. Uh, on the, more on the technology side, we created the uh, Citizenity um, Project, which is a very simple idea. It simply aggregates feeds. So uh, at this point in the project, there were 50 uh, community feeds that were aggregated and redisplayed. One thing that happens when you do that is that um, a display of updates and initiatives that could seem very moribund and, and lacking in all life uh, becomes 50 times more exciting because uh, purely through aggregation. So uh, this actually matters to people though, who look at information. Um, so it takes information that's often sub-threshold makes it uh, above threshold, makes it more noticeable. It also uh, makes the resources in the community more visible, like, and resources could be opportunities, what's happening, who's doing something, and, and so forth. And the latest uh, application of this is that New Leaf uh, uh, used this kind of thing when you walk into their space in Town Hall to inform people who are showing up to do co-work that things are happening and what they might work on together. We also have this app called Community Animator where the idea is make everybody a community animator. You declare your interests and your state of animation in this app and then as you wander around, uh, if you're animated, you're visible to everybody else and uh, you can have a third place on your phone since, unfortunately, you know this idea of third places? You know, it's not, it's not your family and not where you work, it's the other place. Uh, and it used to be uh, taverns, and I guess taverns is the main example, where you uh, go and uh, talk with your, your other working class male comrades. Um, I don't know, so it's also kind of a cartoonish idea, but, but the... Um, uh, the idea of a third place is that this is a, 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 a sort of a, a core institution of community to um, get together and talk about things that aren't working in our family because that's the, the shared interest in the community. So uh, in Community Animator, we've explored you know, what 
what kinds of rubrics would be effective? What rubrics are people interested in? For example, uh, people don't want to focus on news. Um, they want to focus on activity or interests, you know, commitments, but not, not news items, which is interesting. You'll see other systems that are about, about news. Um, and we, the method we're using to study this is through community animation happenings, which is uh, good for me. It's something I can contribute since I was alive in the 1960s when there were happenings. Um, <laughs> But what we do is we gather a bunch of people together and uh, let them animate each other. Um, so this is, this is work that's uh, uh, it's underway. Uh, Future State College is uh, an idea that was caused by the idea of Lost State College. Actually, I should have mentioned when I went through um, the, story, the Lost State College story that um, Lost State College was a term that one of my... Uh, one of the leaders in the community came up with, and we were inspired us to build the app. But I actually think it should be called Found State College because it's a way of discovering the history of the community. It's not the lost part, I think, is what we shouldn't be emphasizing in that, but yeah, that's the way names go. It's, it's called Lost State College. Um, the Future State College project, besides just being uh, routine creativity where you try to turn things upside down um, was uh, inspired by a discussion going on in the community about the 12-year master plan and most municipalities have a long-term planning horizon process they go through and nobody pays any attention to it except the usual suspects which are three people that you know try to out have outsized influence everybody else ignores it until it's been a uh, uh, approved and then they start complaining. Um, that, that's how democracy works. Um, <laughs> but we thought uh, a, a way to make this more uh, approachable for people would be instead of having a large document to have small vision envisionments of how it would change particular places you could go to. So the way this works is you walk around the community and if there's a part of the master plan that pertains to where you are Future State College tells you what's going to go there. And um, you can think about it standing in the place where the change uh, will occur. And people found this very stimulating and made a lot of comments. And in fact, this let us discover another interesting thing uh, about our community government partners, which is uh, how thin a line there is between uh, the the concern that people aren't engaged, aren't playing a role, aren't being creative, aren't pushing government, and the concern that they are. <laughs> and uh, this was an exam a case in point. So people went from having no interest in the master plan to giving lots of suggestions, and then that became a problem for the municipal government. Although that is probably one one would guess over time they'd be happy to adjust to. Um, we also used a slightly different kind of method here, which was accosting people as they walked through the street, which worked very well, and people were actually very happy to be accosted. Of course, you have to be somewhat careful. Um, critically integrate information sources. So a traditional proxy measure of community um, in studies of community is, is whether you read the local newspaper which is really not a good measure anymore since uh, we know that people, it's more a marker of age than uh, engagement in the community. Uh, people don't read papers anymore, so it's not really a, a good proxy measure. But it's also asking too little in a way, because this age, uh, or that age, of community uh, awareness was really just a, a passive kind of awareness, like knowing what's happening, knowing that there's a meeting, knowing that there was a result. But it's not an active engagement. It's not like Future State College where you uh, push your comments to the town council. So in exploring this, we came up with the concept of local news chatter. This system, integrates uh, two sorts of feeds, uh, Twitter feeds from local accounts and uh, uh, local 
news feeds uh, from uh, formal media, like we have, a, we have a newspaper and we also have a student newspaper. It's often hard to figure out which one is which, but we have two papers and we also have a, a public, uh, uh, public media and uh, other, well, we have five in total that we use for this. And what we do is we uh, classify the tweets and the news stories by uh, text analysis using uh, a term frequency, inverse document frequency uh, counts. And uh, this, uh, this uh, tag cloud here indicates the topics that are extracted. The larger ones are in the, uh, the top uh, frequency quartile, and then we have ones in the lower frequency quartile, which would be more, the top ones would be more like following up things you've heard <coughs> about already, and the bottom ones would be more discovery oriented, things you might very well not have heard about. But the, so basically what you have is a news story here, so this could be from the local newspaper, and then these are the tweets that using uh, TFIDF are, are uh, diagnosed as being about the same thing, right? Namely the tag that you selected to initiate this. Does everybody get this arrangement? It's not too complicated. Um, so there's continual text analysis going on in the background and actually even in the scale of our town, which is rather small, um, this uh, changes all the time. Uh, it's probably the tweets that are driving the change. And it integrates formal and informal community uh, news and facilitates uh, discussion. Uh, use this word hyperlocal. It's news about the place, uh, used by the people in the place, and you know, directed to people in the place. Um, and uh, for this, we deployed this for a, a trial, to try to get people to use it. And 35 people we worked with, 27. Uh, were susceptible to that, and uh, and so I have here their usage uh, characteristics. Um, anyway, what we found is that this uh, co-presentation of tweets and news was in fact interesting to people. That they uh, found that there was a lot of a lot of additional insight generated by seeing the two news sources animated together. Uh, here's a person who was very negative about Twitter, but got more interested in it when they saw this kind of use of it. And uh, it raised interest in tweeting and retweeting and because people would find things that struck them and then retweet something. And of course, that is also part of the feed. Um, and we did get some comments also about people who we're surprised to know that uh, tweets are publicly available and can be repurposed. <laughs> and so that's a privacy issue of people have uh, already <coughs> analyzed. But uh, I, I wouldn't say that was so much a concern, but a surprise to people. Um, the fourth theme that I wanted to um, expand a bit is um, making conflict and synthesis more uh, visible. And uh, we studied this by uh, investigating some large-scale community, uh, you can really call them deliberations, they were issues. Um, uh, one that was very exciting was this high-pressure gas pipeline routing issue. And you probably know that the way the gas network works is there's a trunk line of high-pressure pipes, and the one in your house isn't that, but the one out in your street might be that. And of course, if you're thinking about the very worst thing that can happen, um, the higher pressure pipes blow up a lot more with more violence. So uh, the debate in the community, a classic not in my backyard kind of thing in one sense, <coughs> was where to route the gas pipeline. And it's very interesting to see this discussion from start to finish, since uh, it involved all the things that worried Coleman, you know, uh, people escalating in how uncivil and nasty they were to get their way uh, and doing things that can never be undone uh, socially. Um, but nevertheless, this is really for us, uh, uh, Gris, we're interested in putting in place methods that are different. 
one of the things that's happening here, and, and it was true in the gas pipeline issue, and really in spades, is that because people think issues like this will uh, engender conflict, they submerge them. But of course, that just means that when people discuss, discover them, they, they, it's like uh, exponentially greater. Everybody's much more mad. So, uh, so our, our position is things should be more visible. We studied the uh, uh, Citizen Initiative uh, Review in Oregon, which is mandated by state law. Oregon's one of these states that has a lot of ballot initiatives where people vote on um, uh, laws directly. Um, the, this is important because this is not how town governments work. Most town governments in the U.S. are what's called a council and mayor model. Um, laws are voted by councils. So you can try to influence councilors, but you have no influence on the law. I'm not sure about California. I would expect you probably have ballot initiatives for everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not true where I live. <laughs> anyway, um, so in Oregon, they had this model. It was documented at state law. We, we studied their practice. It's interesting because what they do is convene a panel of citizens who are not supposed to, they're allowed to have positions, but their job is to create high quality pro-con analyses for voters. So the target of the citizen initiative review is a voter's guide. It's very brief, very succinct, and calls out the, the, um, the uh, important issues pro and con. And because this is done at a state level, they, the panel of citizens is informed by experts, uh, really international uh, experts. Uh, so it's, it's, it's done at a scale that really, in some ways, would not scale to a town. Um, nevertheless, we scaled it to a town. We call ours community issue review, and it's, it's, it's aimed a little differently because citizens don't pass ballot initiatives in Pennsylvania, or more, more specifically in State College. Um, we focused it on analysis of plans. So for example, uh, there's a plan to put surveillance cameras in a residential neighborhood that's near the campus. Um, who they're gonna pick up is probably students that are throwing beer bottles in their backyard and stuff like major crimes like that. But anyway, that's, that's a, one discussion. Another one was a proposal for a uh, mixed use uh, development project. But, so that's what we're focusing on, is the analysis of plans. So at an early stage, try to get people involved in the process. But in other ways, the mandate to people is similar. We want them to create a high-quality pro-con analysis, not uh, justify the extreme decision, that, the most extreme decision they can see themselves occupying. And uh, I'd say this is a work in progress, but uh, we've also made a lot of headway. Um, uh, people, people do try to, uh, people are used to working the system, and what we do with those people is we put them on the panel, <laughs> because that's really the best way to learn uh, that uh, things can be resolved and there are other stakeholders besides you. So uh, that's, that's our um, approach to making conflict more visible. Uh, the fifth one I had was identifying and better leveraging resources. And communities uh, have a lot of resources they don't know about. So I, I alluded to this earlier, but uh, in studies I did in Blacksburg, the rate of community brokers, where a broker is somebody who is a member of two or more organizations, this is exactly analogous to Bert's definition of a corporate broker. Um, is uh, nine times higher. It's 47% of participants instead of 5%, which is what Bird found. Also, the longevity of brokers in a community context, that's how long you continue to participate in, in two or more uh, associations, uh, municipal associations of some sort, um, is about uh, four and a half times longer so uh, after two years, we found 90% were still active. Bert finds 20%. So these are interesting resources that uh, are not really taken advantage of. If, if a corporation 
had a rate of brokers and a longevity of brokers like this, we would assume based on what Bert found, that they'd be the most innovative organization on earth. Um, but that's not what communities expect, nor do they have any way of utilizing these, uh, these multifaceted uh, connections. Um, here's another one, which is a, uh, a workshop that we started with the help of the uh, NSF. And this is taking Andrew Cohill's idea about community learning very seriously. Um, we, were, we worked with groups to find what their big challenge was and then get them together in a workshop setting to talk about their challenge. And what we found is that for a lot of these challenges, there is expertise to address them in the community. It's just not being leveraged very well because it's not visible. So there have been uh, eight of these workshops now, and um, this, is, this is, I call this the shared challenge resource. If everybody is aware that there's a need, that's a resource. Uh, not, you know, it's not, it doesn't make things worse, it makes them better to get together and, and find out other people have that problem too. Five minutes. Yeah, I know. Well, it's not going to work. <laughs> well, anyway, I already told you what the talk is about, so you can, can, uh, the rest will be left as an exercise. I've also been working in time banking, which is another um, approach to identifying resources in a community. Here, the idea is, first, first, one kind of resource is your participation. That's a resource. But another very important resource, very easy to miss, is your willingness to accept help from somebody else. That's a huge resource. Um, and time banking makes these resources more visible. Time banking is an exchange mechanism where what you exchange is valued by the time it takes to share it. So, you know, I mow your lawn, it takes an hour, and, um, you know, that gives me an hour credit in the time bank, and uh, somebody else can give me a violin lesson for that. Um, and this is a, it's a very in, it's an interesting kind of institution. It, it can almost strike you as a wacky idea at first, especially if you know Edgar Kahn, who is totally wacky and invented <laughs> it. Um, but it's spread across the world. There are thousands of time banks in the world, and it's actually been <coughs> favored also uh, by the turbulence in the global economy. In uh, Spain, just to pick a troubled country. Uh, time banking tripled in, in, in five years, participation in time banking. So uh, a lot of it looks like this. It's on the web. Uh, you, you post these offers to do things for others and needs that you would like to have fulfilled. And we developed mobile time banking. Our motive for doing that was to make time banking more flexible so that it would be less transactional, less, have to be less planful, a web-based uh, interaction is something you're planning what you're going to do tomorrow or next week. Uh, an, an app interaction, you could be thinking what you're going to do in an hour. And, and uh, you know, so I have this scenario here. A young mother is stuck at home with a sick kid and runs out of aspirin. If that person can ask the community who's near the pharmacy, there's a good chance somebody is. Um, so that's just one kind of example, but there would be many others. So we've, we've worked with Our World, which is the largest time bank aggregator in the U.S., and uh, we have several thousand users of this uh, mobile time banking app uh, now in a survey. We've just finished, I think we finished data collection, but we haven't analyzed it yet. Um, yeah, I should, I should also say in terms of the growth of time banking, Our World, in the two years we worked with them and deployed this app, and possibly the app was a factor, but I doubt it. Uh, they doubled in size. So time banking, even though it seems a little bit counterintuitive, it's definitely a happening thing. Um, so I'm going to skip the study and uh, the trading spheres. This is just this finding, like your, uh, like your, uh, your uh, factory game. Mm -hmm. uh, people trade with their uh, friends, and all the ones that don't have friends trade as if they were in a friend group. <laughs> And then there's also some movement from acquaintances uh, upgrading to friends and strangers upgrading to acquaintances. So I'll just say a few words about co-production. The interesting thing to notice here, and again, it, it could be subtle, is um, 
There are a lot of services that can't be delivered. We often talk about service delivery. I kind of think this really is a mistaken view because in all these domains I've listed here, learning, emotion, health and well-being, social support, uh, you can't deliver services. You have to have the co active cooperation of the person you're delivering the service to. You can ignore that contribution, but that may not be a good idea if you want to understand what's happening. Just, I can't resist it, describing this example from the British National Health Service, where in some time banks in Britain, you can be prescribed time bank service for mood disorders. So, <laughs> so if you have mild depression, your National Health Service doctor, of course, they're really saving a lot of money in health in England, you know, um, could prescribe service in a time bank. So what do you do? You, you end up walking with an elderly person to do food shopping. <coughs> um, you're providing that person with a service and you're also getting the, fulfilling the prescription you have to serve in a time bank. Mm -hmm. That's really a good value equation for medical uh, service. Um, so I call it hyper-efficient <laughs> because it's, it's much better than costing nothing. It actually produces value as people get healthier. Um, and so we're working on a, an app, which I also describe this as time banking without the time or the bank. Um, and in, in this app, you basically uh, hook up with somebody to go to lunch or walk your dog or other common co-productions where the key thing here, I promised I would tell you this, but I'm running out of time to do it, um, is that uh, this is not a matter of altruism, being a nice person. It's really, uh, for co-production to actually be occurring, you have to get value and the person you're interacting with gets value. And there's also an indirect effect of social capital. So it's hyper-efficient, and just like the uh, uh, National Health Service example. And so um, this one, I have no idea how it's going to work. It's not, uh, it's not uh, deployed at all yet. OK, so this is a slide you already saw before, so I won't spend any time on it. This is the one. It was my point. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, these are the six things that I mentioned. I've referred to them a few times. I mentioned they're not uh, properly factored yet, but if you have ideas for doing that, I'd be happy to co-produce something with you. Um, and then just to say that this idea of the community as an innovation um, laboratory, it, it's not a new idea. The, the, uh, uh, the, no, the term living laboratory, at least as I've been able to determine, comes from Robert Park in 1925, so it's pretty much the foundations of American sociology. Um, and as I also mentioned, the three decades of community networking were arguably all about uh, technology-driven uh, innovation. This is also not hard to do. Maybe I've conveyed that, uh, perhaps not, but it's a lot of fun to work with your neighbors and uh, local government and things like that. There are very interesting external factors. We all despair about them. We were talking about things at dinner last night, sort of uh, making ourselves sad. And of course, that's easy. it's easy to get that way, but you could also say we live in interesting times, and social innovations are uh, the only way we're going to get through it, or uh, even get through it at all. Um, so um, oh, current, in, well, can I do this, or should I, I could skip this? I could, should skip this. Okay. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Time for one or two questions. I guess the last one. Uh, where do you see the role of the big social networks in this? Like, do you think that, um, do you think that it's possible in the future, maybe Facebook <coughs> would take up the role of providing more like real communities and people that are locally around you? Well, I mean, Facebook itself is pretty innovative and has engendered lots of innovations. I think it's, I think my answer is more it's just operating at a different scale. Um, uh, and again, I think in the community informatics world, I think there's way too much defensive sensitivity about, you know, global tools like Facebook. I, I think if, if people, if there's a tool that causes people to interact and uh, trust more and 
you know, know more about others and perhaps be more innovative, uh, uh, that can't be all bad. So, so I think that's all good. It's just at a different scale. So my, my work is all focusing on uh, locales and trying to find the resources in locales and uh, make, them, make them useful, innovatively make them useful. Did you have a question? Yeah. So um, we have red states and blue states, and communities are purple. And so the uh, visibility and the conflict that you've been addressing, uh, you know, these are issues that are more um, not, not so deep-seated as political differences or people's uh, attitudes toward race and ethnicity. Right. Have you ever thought about trying to address more deep-seated differences among people in a community? Has anyone ever tried that, and has there ever been some Well, I could answer, I could answer uh, for Talkville. <laughs> okay. I, think, uh, I think that the argument would be that if you can build more cooperation and do more productive things at a local level, that that will provide a foundation for more, for respect for uh, liberty and equality at uh, higher levels. I mean, that's the, like you, you just framed it, community is purple. And so I think it's a resource for dealing with that higher level uh, conflict. And I think if people develop habits of the heart, for example, uh, debating in a respectful way local issues, like the gas pipeline, then they might be, that those skills might translate to other kinds of discussions. But, uh, but what we see is that uh, there's a shortage of those skills at the local level. So I, I think you know, one answer is we've got a lot to do just there. And then we could see if that provided a, a better foundation for making a you know, more functioning society otherwise. The other point uh, also coming from Talkville is that uh, our form of government really is designed to make this happen to us. You know, you know? I mean, the design of Congress. No, I, I talked about the design rationale of democracy. I mean, if you look at the, the design of Congress, it's designed to work exactly as it works. So uh, I think the problem is it's not really the people. You know, I think we've designed a system to screw ourselves. You know? It's working. <laughs> On that happy note, let's <laughs>